Hello, and welcome to Tomorrow Today, an SAE podcast. We're honored today to have Vince Lichtinger from Marathon Patrolling today. Welcome, Vince. Hey, good to be here, Grayson. Good to see you. It's awesome. It's an, it's an honor to have you here on the podcast. You and I have had all these wonderful conversations about the future of uh, petroleum, the future of fuel, and the future of autonomy. So I'm happy to make this conversation yeah, public. Yeah, be fun. As a way of kicking off the podcast, it'd be great if you can just give us a little overview of yourself and uh, Marathon Petroleum. Okay. Well, I've been with Marathon for almost 31 years. I'm a chemical engineer by training. I started with Marathon in 1989, and I was doing process simulations of the refineries back then, kind of a, a technology geek way back then even. I spent about six years in the upstream side of our business, providing process engineering for our, our gas processing plants and compression facilities. In 1995, I moved to product quality and spent a lot of time in there working on ensuring our fuels and specs were okay for, for gasoline, diesel, and all the other things. And I spent a little time in our HES auditing group and also spent some time doing operational excellence for our logistics and storage group. I spent a lot of about six years in our terminals, transport, and rail group on trucking logistics and terminal operations. And then I've been doing this role, manager of fuels and emerging technologies, since November of 2017. A little bit about Marathon. We are actually the nation's largest refinery. We have over 3 million barrels per day of refining capacity across 16 refineries in 13 states. And just to kind of frame that up a little bit, we make 17% of the jet fuel used in the United States. Along with that, we have a large midstream presence through our MLP, MPLX. We transport and store crude biofuels and refined products through pipelines, terminals, trucks, and barges. And we also gather, process, and transport natural gas and natural gas liquids and then we have about 12,000 retail locations under the Speedway Marathon and Arco brand. But something that's really cool that, that people don't think about a lot is we have an ever-expanding biofuels business. We have about 475 million gallons per year of ethanol production capacity through a JV with the Andersons. We wholly own an 80 million gallon per year biodiesel plant in Cincinnati. And we're converting our Dickinson, North Dakota refinery to 100% renew, renewable diesel fuel, of course, for California LCL, LCFS. That should be done by the end of this year, and it's going to make about 184 million gallons per year of renewable diesel. We are going to co-process biointermediates from municipal solid waste at our Martinez refinery in California later this year. And finally, we have Virant. It's a wholly owned subsidiary of Marathon, and they have a novel process that converts bio-based feedstocks into renewable fuels and chemicals. Right now, that's at a demonstration plant level. And this is this is incredible, Marathon, and as been properly identified by Wall Street and by industries, an incredibly well-managed company that's doing in incredible things. And there's a lot of things that stood out in there for me. You've been there 31 years, and obviously the petroleum business has changed over 31 a years. Lot. What would you say some of the biggest changes that you've seen over the course of your, your career over the 31 years? Good question. I would say the some of the biggest things I've seen are, of course, the larger refineries have gotten larger, smaller refineries basically either need to stay up with the technology or they, they, they can't and they end up being rationalized out of business. We, we've seen a lot of technology improvements within the refining space. We've also seen a lot of fuel regulations. We've vastly reduced sulfur and gasoline and diesel fuel. We, we've controlled aromatics. Really today, you know, we had reformulated gasoline in the past, and gasoline today is very nearly as clean as that reformulated gasoline in the past. So we've seen our products clean up a lot. We've seen a, an intense focus on energy efficiency, particularly in our refineries, where we're really focusing on being as efficient in reducing our carbon intensity per barrel as much as we can. Not only, and we talk about that, we can talk about that later if we need to, but EPA has Energy Star program, and over the past several years, we have won many of those awards. In fact, the last two years, we've been the Energy Star Partner of the Year with the EPA, and we just have a, a driven focus on making sure we're, we're operating as cleanly as we can. I think that's interesting because at the end of the day, petroleum companies are diversified energy companies. You've talked about renewable diesel, Energy Star partners, and as in, in automotive and mobility, there's a big shift towards electrification. Right. And there's a lot of talk where EV companies, EV charging infrastructure is going to deplace petroleum companies. As you and I know, Marathon Petroleum pays more in a quarterly dividend than every electric vehicle charging infrastructure company has raised to date. Right, right. Marathon's not going anywhere. Large petroleum companies are not going anywhere. 
But how do you think that the future of electricity will play into a really diversified energy company such as Marathon? Well, I think we're going to see a lot of need as, as the global community grows, we need more and more energy. That's kind of a given. So whether it's whether the vehicles are electrified or they're on liquid fuels, you're going to see an ever expanding pool for that type of energy. I think if you specifically look at electrified vehicles, focusing on plug in hybrids and battery electric, full battery electric vehicles, and you don't look, this isn't a marathon prediction. We look at many consultants and government agencies that are out there and you see that they range by 2035 from 4% fleet penetration to 25% fleet penetration. And that's really important to focus on fleet penetration and not sales because sales can grow exponentially, but we really need to see who in the fleet is going to be consuming that energy. So, so the, the most um, aggressive forecast shows 25% EVs by 2035. So there's going to be some electrification. I think we're going to see the vehicles in the United States. This is my personal opinion. We're going to see getting more heterogeneous. We're going to see more electrification on the coasts, warmer temperate areas. But we have to remember there's a lot of rural, cold areas in the United States that EVs simply aren't going to work well in. And we're going to see those are going to be strongholds of liquid fuels for a long time to come. You know, and, and, and it's interesting because I think the other aspect is charging anxiety. Right. When um, you and I have had this conversation when I looked at buying an electric vehicle and my daughter was three at the time, oh, you can just charge in 45 minutes. I'm like, you don't understand. There's a three-year-old in the car. You can't do it. You have to be able to go like at a gas station, you pump and, and you leave. Right. When do you think that the technology will evolve to the point where from putting on your engineer hat that you can charge the same time that you could put a liquid fuel in your car? Do you think, how far do you think we are away from that? Oh, well, I, that is not my area of expertise, but I think we're a ways from that. And I think even even if you can go from zero to a full charge in, let's say, 15, 10 or 15 minutes, I know with we've all been trained to get panicky when our batteries get below 50% and our phones and other things. So it'll be very interesting if people are comfortable driving down to 10% charge because that's going to take a mental shift on all of our parts. And I also think that as we evolve to that, you know, if the charging getting quicker, we need, there's going to be a lot of issues we're going to run into potentially around demand charges and the structure of how and who is doing that charging. There's, there's a lot of regulations in the background that I think are going to need to be dealt with. So I, don't, I can't tell you when, but I think it's a ways off. And I think not, it's, it's a, a compounded by consumer perceptions by the actual infrastructure upstream of the charger and also some of the regulatory pressures around it. And don't you think that's where hybrids come in? Like they fill that really sweet spot. So they have a battery, they're running on liquid fuels. And if you see some of the, the, the fleets that are deploying for autonomous vehicles, they're running Ford Fusion hybrids or they're running Chrysler Pacific minivans. Do you see that hybrid kind of really filling in that, that gap? I think from an engineer's perspective, the hybrid is the best thing we have out there. My concern is and, and before I go to the concern, my, because of exactly what you said, you have this robust electric system, and then you also have very energy dense internal combustion engine that can provide uh, power over long ranges. The concern I have with plug-in hybrids, and I think why we see some some reduction in that market is consumers. I'm not sure if consumers know what to do with them. You know, consumers are dealing with: Do I plug it in? Do I fill it up? Do I use lane keep assist? Do I, you know, forward forward collision? How does that work? There's a touch screen in front of me in this car. You know, how does I just I'm very concerned with how are we going to educate the consumer around autonomy, around electrification, around um, just the, the you know, my mom and dad got jumped ten years from you know from one vehicle to another one and the technology is very challenging to a, a you know an elderly person. And that brings up a really interesting point because in twenty nineteen less than two percent of the vehicles, and that's all vehicle types and sold in America were electrified, either fully electric or plug-in hybrids. Right. To me, that really stood out. Right. And there's there's one brand that we all know that's doing well Correct. for a full electric, and there's other brands that are not doing well. And it's interesting you brought up the, the education aspect, and if you kind of look at, uh, you mentioned your parents and older individuals, it's really important that I, you know, I emphasize this every time I talk about it, but the dividend that Marathon and companies such as Marathon pays out in 2018, Marathon paid out $1.84 billion U.S. dollars in dividends. And since going public in 2011, you've had a 25% dividend growth rate. Right. The, yep. the thing I think it's important for the education aspect to point out is that there's a lot of individuals that are retired, getting ready to retire, that depend on that dividend income for their, okay. their livelihood. And there's certain forces that want to disrupt that. Right. Do you think that the individuals that depend on that dividend are really going to kind of look 
for in trying to encourage their their children, their grandchildren to look at new technologies, or they're going to kind of still say, "Hey, look, oil's not this you know this big bad com- right. perception that it gets." Do you think that they're going to help educate their kids about the positive benefits that oil companies have on the economy that they have on their local families and their households? Mm-hmm. Well, it, you know, I come from a unique perspective because Marathon is headquartered in Finley, Ohio, which is a, a small town. You know, we'll say, I'll probably get this wrong, but 45,000 plus. And so Marathon's a very important part of the community. And I think people there uniquely understand the benefits of liquid fuels. Going forward, I, I wonder, as you talk about dividends and those types of things, I wonder if, if our children, I have a 20-year-old and a 23-year-old, understand the, the the robust flow of you know of finances like you're talking about from them and i wonder if our children are understanding the need for our, all types of fuels how energy demand is growing across the globe now granted in the united states we're, we're a mature economy so we may have a slightly different story but if you look at china and india and just the, the sheer growth there how are we as a as a, a world going to to manage this energy growth and, and, you know, a lot of liquid fuels can jump right in there and cover that gap. A very energy dense, very easy to transport. So it'll be interesting to see how that evolves. And do you, do you see the renewable diesel as, as the autonomous trucking becomes a very hot topic now? Do you see renewable diesel uh, growing as a liquid fuel becoming uh, more accessible? I think you're going to definitely see renewable diesel grow primarily because it, it addresses the need to uh, satisfy the LCFS in California. Beyond the borders of California, I think it'll depend on how quickly companies can spin up plants to make it and and how quickly the demand shifts through the United States. But it's definitely a key component because it's very difficult to electrify heavy-duty trucking. And can you, does for, you know, trucking a lot of, one of the largest costs is the cost of fuel uh, for long-haul trucking. Do you get a better miles per gallon on renewable diesel than you do versus, you know, heavy-duty diesel? You know, I think I've not seen studies on that, but it's a drop in fuel, so it should really perform almost exactly the same. And there's there's different ways. It's it's really, you know, we one of the nice things about refining is you have this processing equipment that processes liquid hydrocarbons. Now, whether that hydrocarbon comes from the ground or it comes from a bean or wherever, it's it's very similar processing. So refiners in general have a lot of expertise around processing those molecules. So in some cases, renewable diesel comes out with very high cetane, but it's got very poor cold flow properties. So that's when you need to start playing with the molecules and and adjusting things to meet what people expect now in fuel. So I think it's more of a matter of renewable diesel is going to be manufactured to work as a drop in fuel in diesel engines. And then once the manufacturing is figured, then uh, assuming the next part is the distribution factor, is that the next part of getting it to the ports and to the depots and to the various stations, is that the next logistical part of getting more into yeah. the ecosystem? Yeah, I, you know, the, the liquid fuels distribution system, and you've heard me say this many times, it's very efficient, multimodal, and complex. We can move it on a truck, we can move it on a pipeline, we can move it on a barge, and you have a fuel like renewable diesel that, that's very drop-in as opposed to an ethanol or a biodiesel that require a little special handling. It, it will just, it'll just slip into the stream and show up where it needs to. It's, it's very easy to move this stuff around. And when you look at this, do you look at it from early in your career with a trucking logistics background? Do you, are you looking at this in a completely different way of understanding all the logistic aspects of trucking? Yeah, that's a, yeah, very interesting. And in general, there's a shortage of drivers in the United States, truck drivers. And I think you can see, for instance, in our world, when we're moving, delivering product to a, a service station, that requires, first of all, a hazmat license, and then interaction in a service station with the public and with, you know, putting gasoline into the storage tank. So that's very, um, I think I see that being automated further into the future than other things, but certainly we have a lot of, probably not the right word, but benign cargo that moves around the United States that can benefit from this technology and free up drivers to do the more, you know, safety sensitive or more um, complex tasks in the trucking world. So yeah, definitely to that point. Yeah, because what you're doing is that that asset will create revenue for Marathon, but then it's also going to create jobs on the on the local level. Correct. I think that's really important. And Marathon's also creating jobs with the 17% of jet fuel used in the U.S. Right. You're creating all those local jobs. Right. And it was really interesting when you're talking about the, the jet fuel of Marathon. Has that always been um, a, a substantial part of the business for that, or is that kind of like a newer? No, it's always been a big part of our business. Uh, with of course with the the Endeavor acquisition that brought us to that 17% I told you about. 
It's very important. Jet fuel is, and it's it's very interesting product because it's everybody that touches it makes sure makes sure it's okay because it's the chain of custody is intense in jet fuel for obvious reasons. And then it, it really follows the cycle. In addition to people moving around, the the movement of packages now has really made the criticality of getting jet fuel where it needs to be important. It's interesting that you you talk about that, like jet fuel where it has to be, because. We had a conversation at dinner last night, and um, we're saying, "Okay, everybody, raise your hand if Amazon comes to your house at least once a week." Yep. And every everybody. every hand went up. Sure. And when you start looking at the whole logistical supply chain, that becomes really interesting. It's like, okay, well, you had to have there was some sort of fuel that got that package to you. Correct. And it's really incredible that Marathon plays that really important strategic role. And as a chemical engineer by trade, what are your thoughts on the changes automotive engineers are facing? as the industry shifts towards autonomy? Well, I think that's a really interesting question because we're going to continue to see electrification continue. Uh, uh, you know, the automakers at this point, to me, face unprecedented challenges right now. They're working on electrifying propulsion systems. They're w- working on maintaining their existing and very profitable internal combustion engine businesses. And they're working to keep up with autonomy R&D and implementing those systems. So it's like this, this trifecta of um, critical path things are working on, it seems to me. And I think, this is just me personally, when we talk about CASE or ACES, Connected, Automated, Shared, and Electrified, we do the general public a disservice because those are four separate technologies. And we need to unwind those and assess those individually. Connected, well, most of our cars are connected already. Automated, we have the ADAS systems that are proliferating, and we've got SA with their, their level zero to five definition. So there's, you know, there's different levels of maturity in each of these technologies shared. We have Ubers, they're shared. So, and then electrified, we have electrification, but to, to, to just drop that whole thing on um, the case or ACEs on an uneducated public is unfair to, without telling them what it means. Yeah, and that goes back to you know, the earlier conversation around education. Right. I think there's a lot of misconceptions around a lot of various brands and, and products in the marketplace. Right. And the best way is just, you know, to experience it. And oil is beneficial because everybody's experienced putting putting gas in their car. Right. And we're going to get there. What do you say that the future holds for Marathon Petroleum as it relates to energy, oil, and the future of autonomy? Well, I think, and, I, and maybe I'll talk more in the uh, overall U.S. refining industry where, where I see us able to supply more and more of the energy for the world. As we said before, there's this growing need for energy as, as you know, China and India, well, and then also South Africa and Africa in general kind of become more more demand for energy. So how are we going to meet that? Well, you know, refineries in the United States are flexible and energy efficient. You saw that with IMO, the, the large complex in the, refi- in the U.S. were able to pivot to that different fuel and, and, and make it. And so as, as the needs in the, the world change, the U.S. refining industry is better able to move to meet some of those needs. Yeah, and we're going to continue to grow. And where do you see, is there any predictions Marathon has made public about the, the future need for energy? I would say no. What we usually look at is IEA or EIA projections and see where that goes. And and again, I mean, a subset of that, like in, in my world at work, is really the electric vehicle fleet penetration. So we tend to look at what IEA or EIA is saying or some of the some of the other consultants that are out there. And really, and, and versus doing our own look at that, it's better for us to see what the, the you know the general trend is across and have a have a have a a band of potential growth there. Yeah, and it's it's interesting, and I think that the the biggest takeaway I would say is that for you know the individuals that are listening is that diversified petroleum oil companies will become diversified energy companies, and they will play an extremely large outsized role in the U.S. economy in the global economy, they will create local jobs, they will create international jobs, they will support retirees that have saved for their retirement, and they'll, they'll continue to do really great things. And I think the biggest takeaway um, for those listening that large diversified oil companies will become diversified energy companies, but they will always continue to innovate. They understand research and development probably better than any company. Your research budgets, from what I've read, are larger than you know, most tech companies combined. And I tip my hat to you for the work that you've done at Marathon, the work that the thank you. company's done. And I really thank you for coming on the SAE podcast tomorrow today to talk about 
you know, what Marathon's doing today and what Marathon's going to uh, do in the future. So I thank you very much, Vince. Thanks. I enjoyed it. Awesome. Thanks. Thank you for listening to SAE's Tomorrow Today podcast. If you've enjoyed this episode, please kindly rate it, share your feedback, we love comments, and subscribe on your favorite podcast platform. For more information on SAE and SAE podcast, be sure to visit sae.org forward slash podcast and follow SAE on social media at SAEINTL on Twitter and Instagram and at SAE International on Facebook and LinkedIn. SAE International makes no representations as to the accuracy of the information presented in this podcast. The information and opinions are for general information only. SAE International does not endorse, approve, recommend, or certify any information, product, process, service, or organization presented or mentioned in this podcast.